You! Me? You think this is funny? In a cosmic sort of way, yes. Well, Mr. Funny Man, is this how you get your sick kicks? What? It's just an ordinary crabby- OH MY GOODNESS! Alright everybody, we're halfway to the finish line. We're making great progress with this movie, so let's get this wagon train a moving. We last left off with the Looney Tunes brutally assaulting Buzz Lightyear much to Woody's... Apathy, I guess. Oh my god, this movie is so stupid. But he eventually tells them that he has a kid and that he'll take them to her if they stop attacking Buzz, and so Daffy and Bugs Bunny join the party as they continue on their quest to rescue Forkface. Terrific. Meanwhile, back in the RV, Bonnie is crying about losing the spork, so her parents agree to check outside for him one last time before they set off down the road again to continue their trip, thus prompting the other toys to quickly think of a plan for how to stop them from leaving while Woody and Buzz are still out there, and- WHY ARE YOU ALL STUCK IN AN RV?! WHO GIVES A FLYING HOOT ABOUT THE LOONEY TUNES AND THE STUPID MENTALLY DEFECTED EATING UTENSIL? WHY HAVE YOU QUARANTINED OFF ALL THE TOYS WE actually care about and are attached to, including Jesse, one of the three leading stars of the previous movies, in this stupid RV where they can do absolutely nothing for the plot. And it's even more confusing when you look at the marketing for this film. Everything from the promotional posters to the trailers. Jesse, Ham, Buzz, Bo, Rex, Potato Head. Ah! Hey, watch it, buddy. Let's go save a spork. Including the original teaser trailer, makes it seem like the original toys we actually care about are going to have a much more significant role to play in this movie than they actually do. Almost like the writers knew no one was going to care about the stupid new character, so instead of rewriting their script, they falsely manipulated the marketing to trick the audience into thinking that they were going to get more screen time for characters that they were attached to than they actually were. Or something crazy like that. Oh, but fear not everybody, because it looks like Jessie's finally going to get to do something important. But it's too little too late, because aside from the fact that she would have gone out that window with Buzz, and she'd have never sat idly by when there was an adventure to be had. You want to know what Jessie does in this scene? You want to know what her big role to play is in this movie? What her grand plan is to stop the family from leaving the carnival? Well, she... She... Just... Just have a look for yourself. Go to kindergarten. Huh? Oh, are you kidding me? What did you do? We're not going anywhere. If you get my point. Ah, uh, you really nailed it, Jesse. You really hammered that joke home. No, I am not misleading you here. I am not lying to you. This is actually what happens in this film. Her big role in the movie is popping the tire. That's it. That is the extent of Jesse's importance to this movie. She doesn't join Woody and Buzz in their adventure. She just lazes around in the RV, quickly pops the tire, and then goes right back to lazing until the very end of the movie, which is an entirely other can of worms we're gonna have to open. But perhaps I'm getting ahead of myself again, because guess what? You're never gonna believe it. This makes no sense. Putting aside the fact that Jesse's minimal role in the story is so lame, there is no way in the world that she should have ever been able to pop this tire. First of all, what exactly was her plan here? She's been inside the RV the whole time they've been here, so there's no way she could have possibly known about this nail, meaning her plan was as follows. Step one, jump out the window. Step two, duh. I thought we'd be dead by step two. What was she gonna do next? Just hope that she'd find something to pop the tire with? Okay, fine. Let's say that she just jumped outside with a leap of faith that she'd find some way to accomplish her mission. In that case, the criticism simply shifts from she had had no plan here to- OH MY GOD, AGAIN? AGAIN! You got lucky AGAIN! You added yet another instance of- WOW! Insert character here. Just so happened to- Insert plot necessary action here. Onto the mountain of contrivance you already had? Why is this script just a giant pachinko machine where characters just get randomly lucky or unlucky depending on the situation? But as if that wasn't enough, the actual logistics involved in the popping of this tire are absolutely laughable. Really think about what would have had to occur in order for this to happen. Jesse grabbed the nail and used it to penetrate a car tire with her bare hands. Do you even need me to explain to you how absolutely absurd that is? Tires are designed to be able to absorb damage while out on the road traveling at very high speeds. And this film wants you to believe not only that one could be penetrated by pressing a single nail into it, not by running over the nail, mind you, but by manually pressing the nail into the tire, but that a toy would have the strength to do that. I shouldn't need to prove the fact that the toys have less muscular strength than humans, but in case you need evidence, here's Woody and Buzz both trying to push a golf bag off of Lotso when the average human would be able to do so effortlessly. So the idea that Jesse could penetrate this tire with a nail using nothing but her hands is absolutely absurd. Most human beings couldn't do that with their hands. Try to imagine you trying to push this nail into a tire. You couldn't possibly accomplish that by pressing your thumb into it. You need to use your palm to even have a chance at breaking through, and even then I don't know that you'd be able to do it. At least not without seriously injuring yourself in the process. In other words, there is no way that Jesse could have popped this tire with her hands. That did not happen. Nice try, movie. But not only does Jesse disregard science and somehow still manage to pop this thing, she 
does so instantly. Watch this clip again. Jessie leaves the frame, and then five seconds later, the tire is popped. Even if we generously assume that she grabbed the nail as she was running toward the tire and lost no time in the process, that means it took her less than five seconds to pop this tire with the muscular strength of a cowgirl ragdoll. Who wrote this? And as the cherry on top of this travesty of a scene, they play this music. Crazy, <laughs> Followed immediately after by... I'm sorry, Bonnie. We looked everywhere, but... It's like a nervous tick for this movie. When all else fails, play nostalgic music for the audience to gobble up and subsequently disengage the critical thinking skills over. Oh, and one last thing before we move on from this scene. When Bonnie walks off the RV, she doesn't have her backpack. We know she never re-enters the RV since we have full view of the inside while the toys are talking, and yet she magically has her backpack on the next time we see her outside, ready to head to the carnival with Pearl while Magnum fixes the tire. Please remember this for later. It is, much like Woody's Freudian slip from earlier, going to defeat find the finale of this film and allow it to happen. Moving on, Bo leads the way inside the antique shop as the other toys silently follow behind her. Well, silently, except for... Are you kidding me? Move off. You move off. Quit pushing me. Stop. Oh my, maker. That sheep has three heads. No, no, no. I don't... It, how did it take you this long to realize that the sheep had three heads? Anyway, we've reached a crucial point in this film. The plan to rescue four faces is about to begin coming together. And wouldn't you know it, it makes no sense! But before I can tell you why it makes no sense, I have to present to you the logistics of this antique store and the obstacles it presents, followed by Bo's plan of attack, then I'll ask what group of paste-eating preschoolers wrote this, and then I'll explain how none of it makes any sense. Now then. Let's begin! Annabelle has Forkface locked up in the cabinet in the center of the antique shop, which is secured under lock and key, so they need to find a way to retrieve the key from the shopkeeper to even get into the cabinet. But as if that wasn't bad enough, the cabinet is also guarded by a group of four Chucky dolls guarding all possible angles, which doesn't seem so bad in and of itself, they just need to find the time when the dolls aren't looking their way and then run across. But as the final source of trouble in this store, there's also a vicious cat roaming the aisles that takes pleasure in tearing toys to shreds. So. To recap, the team needs to retrieve the key, slip past the Chucky dolls, and maneuver their way past the cat without getting eaten or seen. And Bo's plan to outsmart this treacherous terrain is to retrieve the key to open the cabinet, and then fetch an Evil Knievel knockoff toy that will allow them to jump across the aisle from the shelves above, land on the cabinet, and then use the key to open it up and rescue Forkface. WHAT?! What group of paste-eating preschoolers wrote this tumorous sludge? None of this makes any sense at all! Why do you need an evil Knievel toy to jump across the aisle? Why would you ever choose to use that plan? Hey, Galaxy Brain, where are those Chucky dolls looking? Straight across! They're not looking down! Jumping across the aisle would put you in the direct line of sight of the dolls, instantly exposing your plan! If you simply run across the aisle and jump up onto the ledge right here, you can reach the cabinet door in seconds! But the cat would eat them! Now shut up, you broken crayon! No, it would not! The cat is not omniscient, it can't look everywhere at once. All you have to do is simply send one toy to distract the cat, or literally just wait until it's not looking at you, and then run across the aisle! That's all you had to do! As proven by the fact that upon seeing that Bonnie is in the antique shop, Woody instinctively fearlessly runs across the aisle and it works flawlessly. The only thing that stopped him from getting inside was not having the key in his possession. There is absolutely no reason to execute this moronic and overly convoluted plan, just get the key, distract the cat, and run across the aisle! Game over! Over. And what's absolutely hilarious is that the one necessary part of your plan was the one part you had absolutely no idea how to accomplish, getting the key! What is this plan? Who wrote this? This movie is full of baloney! Oh, and let's not gloss over the fact that Buzz abandons Woody when he charges headfirst into the lion's den in danger of being spotted by both the Chucky dolls and the cat. No, absolutely not. Buzz Lightyear leapt onto Scud when he was about to eat Woody without a second of hesitation. And then again in Toy Story 2. And again. And again. And yet all of a sudden in this scene, he shows absolutely no compunctions about potentially condemning Woody to his death. This movie is full of baloney. Get out of here, you brain dead writers. And let's also not gloss over the fact that Woody charging toward the cabinet and Buzz abandoning Woody to go key hunting with the Looney Tunes and Weeble Wobble only happens because Bonnie just so happens to wander into the antique store at this exact moment. Again, more luck, 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 luck. It's everywhere in this film, all the time, in every scene. But not only that, they turn around and leave less than a minute after entering the store in the first place. Why did you even come here? What was the 
point? You couldn't possibly have gotten further than the entrance area. You didn't look around at anything. You just walked in and then walked right back out again. Why did you even come here in the first place? And please don't try to tell me that, oh, well, her mom probably wanted to show Bonnie the antique store, but then Bonnie got bored and then she wanted to leave. Because if you believe that to be a satisfactory defense, and I'd like to remind you that there is a carnival outside. Given how we've seen Bonnie act throughout this series, there is no way this child got further than five steps into the carnival without stopping dead in her tracks wanting to play one of the games or go on one of the rides. This whole movie is full of baloney. You don't know what you're doing with the script. Also, please notice how Bonnie has her backpack when she enters the store and then suddenly doesn't have her backpack as they leave the store. Please remember this for later. <sighs> So Woody tries to open the cabinet door and we get to eavesdrop in on Forkface's conversation with Annabelle. Woody just sits in the closet with no playtime? Yeah, he told me himself. He's useless. No, shut up! That is not what happened in the beginning of this film! How many times do we have to go over this? Woody was only in there for three out of the seven days in a week. The only reason they were all in the closet was because of a house cleaning and no playtime?! What?! What are you talking about? She literally played with Woody in this movie. You were right next to him when Bonnie played with him. Stop lying about the events of this movie in order to reframe them to neatly fit the nonsensical narrative that you're trying to push onto the audience. So Bo gets mad at Woody for running across the aisle and going against her brain dead plan, but then surprise, the Chucky doll spotted Woody. Wait, 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 what? How did they spot him? He's completely obscured from their field of vision down here. How did they see him? And if they did see him, then why did they wait so long to actually jump down and attack them? And why did they not jump down from two opposite sides so they could actually surround Woody and Bo. Then this happens. Whoa, buddy, you are dead. You are super dead. You are a porcelain doll that was just yeeted across the room and smashed into the floor. You are now a million tiny porcelain pieces. You did not sustain zero damage from that. She's totally fine and gets right back up like nothing happened. What the? So then the Chucky duo kidnaps Woody and starts waddling off to perform surgery on his voice box, but then Bo comes to the rescue to knock one of them down. Why were neither of you keeping guard of Bo Peep? Why did neither of you think that it was a good idea to watch over her in case she somehow wasn't smashed to pieces and got back up again? Remember how Lotso had every square inch of Sunnyside covered with guards of some kind, be them patrols roaming the halls or stationary watchmen? Men with spotlights or a monkey with access to the entire security system yeah well these guys are just wobbling around like confused penguins with tunnel vision and i swear in the name of the monkey if you try to tell me they're ventriloquist dummies they're supposed to be stupid then excuse me while i smash my head into a brick wall in response how far can i push that principle until it breaks how stupid does a villain or group of enemies have to be before you finally say okay maybe they could be a little smarter than this what if it's literally a room full of drooling toddlers what if these are the villains for a movie will you finally say okay Okay, these are really stupid villains. We should probably rewrite this so the villains are actually smart so our heroes can actually have an intimidating threat to try to conquer. Why would you ever advocate for a brain-dead villain who consistently makes the stupidest possible decisions and obviously poses no threat to the heroes when you could instead craft a villain or a team of enemies that is so forced to be reckoned with in terms of their raw intelligence and capabilities? Good grief. Okay, on with the action scene. Chucky doesn't notice that his friend just got dunked on, so he keeps running forward with Woody and then the sheep eat its ass. I can't say. No, really, that's not a joke. I'm not lying to you here. The sheep leap forward and bite down on his butt in an attempt to get him to drop Woody, and then Bo throws her staff at a row of croquet sticks which fall just in time to cause Chucky to fall over and drop Woody onto a random telephone that just so happened to be in the way, thus causing him to fall on the buttons and make this noise. <laughs> thus drawing the attention of a nearby shopper. Sure, random telephone on the floor. Why not? Not like this should be on a shelf or anything like that. Sure, why not pepper some more luck into the mix? So Woody thinks quickly enough to pass himself off as the part of the telephone while Bo and Chucky hide in the shadows waiting for round two, but then oh no, the sheep haven't let go of Chucky's butt yet, and so he runs off with the sheep still in tow. And by the time the shopper runs past so Bo can give chase, they've already mysteriously disappeared into thin air. I don't know how in the world they could have possibly gotten away so quickly when we've already seen that Bo can run way faster than Chucky and easily catch up to him, but more importantly, why are the sheep still holding onto its butt? The whole reason they grabbed on in the first place was because they were trying to get him to let go of Woody, but he already let go of him like an hour ago. There was no reason to still bite down on his butt. Let go, drop down, retreat, and then carry on with the rest of the plan. What are you barnyard animals doing? Let go! Or alternatively, just have Bo command them to let go. Oh wait, never mind. That'd be silly. I mean, it's not like she could just tell them to let go of Chucky and then instantly resolve the conflict. Because that would be really silly if that were the case. Moving on, Bo gets mad at Woody for not listening to her again now that her sheba decided to keep eating its I can't say. And even after Woody profusely apologizes for doing something that literally would have worked if they had the key, she snaps at him and demands that he stay out of her way and that she's getting her sheep back. Bo, listen to me, you porcelain prick. 
You never told Woody about the key. Yeah, remember that bit I told you about how they need a key to unlock the cabinet door? That wasn't something that was ever communicated to Woody. That was something that I told you so you can fully understand how broken this plan is. But Bo never told Woody that they needed a key to get into the cabinet. All she told him was that the aisle was guarded by the Chucky dolls and a cat and that she wanted to jump across the shelves to get to the cabinet. With the information Woody had, it was a perfectly reasonable decision to run across the aisle to try to get Forkface. Not to mention the fact that the plan you want to employ makes absolutely Absolutely no sense and would only put you in even more danger due to it placing you directly in the line of sight of the Chucky dolls. Not to mention the fact that the only reason the doll has your sheep right now is because they refuse to let go of its butt. You are in absolutely no position to reprimand Woody for this right now. Get off your tiny little soapbox. Giggle knows what to do. No, she doesn't. We see in the very next scene that she has absolutely no plan for how to get that key. She states that their objective is to get that key, but she doesn't actually offer a plan for how to get it. Neither of you have any idea what you're doing right now. Now, in fact, at this moment, the only one of you that's had the most amount of success in trying to rescue Fourface has been Woody. Weevil Wobble clearly doesn't know what to do, or else she would have offered an alternate solution when the Looney Tunes suggested brutally assaulting the poor shopkeeper as a potential plan for getting the key. No, I'm not kidding, by the way. There's a solid minute and a half of screen time that is entirely dedicated to listening to Daffy and Bugs regale increasingly disturbing methods for how to get that key, all of which involve a brutal ending for the shopkeeper. Moving on, Chucky tells Annabelle that Woody has returned to the antique store in search of Forkface, and so she prepares to use him to lure Woody right into a trap. Question, if you want Woody to ultimately get into your cabinet and retrieve Forkface so you can corner him and steal his voice box, then what's the point of even having the dolls guarding the area in the first place? Whatever, stay tuned for a few scenes from now to see the results of this gripping drama. Then we come back to Bo leading Woody somewhere, and upon asking her what they're doing... Just stand there and be quiet. Jesus Christ, you heartless b I can't say. All he did was ask you a simple question of what are we doing, and all you could do in response was aggressively tell him to shut up and stand by doing nothing? Actually, what is wrong with you? Woody is doing everything in his power to help you right now, and this is how you treat him? Good lord, maybe it's for the best that you left Woody when you did. I mean, clearly you have no respect for him whatsoever anymore. God, could you imagine if Woody had to spend the rest of his life with her? That'd be awful. I'll do the talking. Ah, yes, because you have such a way with words. Tin Toy lets him into the pinball machine, and upon asking her if Woody is her friend, she says, My friend? No, no, no. He's my accessory. Seriously. Heartless twit. Actually, a terrible, compassionless person with no respect for anybody. We then see the other half of the bisected zebra that the cat wrote apart earlier, and it's... It's a joke. Hey, Doug. Saw your better half at the front of the store. Hey, you mess with the cat, you get the claws. <laughs> I... Okay, first of all, I don't know how in the world you managed to crawl your top half away from the cat in time without it also eating your head, but second of all, really guys? You- you think this is funny? This is literally a toy who was torn in half by a vicious cat, who you just established not five minutes ago as being a massive threat that you needed to account for. Hey, remember in the first movie when we went to Sid's room and it was a collection of mutilated abomination toys that came to be as a result of Sid mixing and matching different toy parts? Remember how that was treated as a truly horrifying and terrifying thing because it was literally a case of ripping body parts from the toys and reattaching them to other toys? Like, you could actually be convinced that this was a horror movie kind of scary? Yeah, well, not anymore. Now toy mutilation is a funny haha. -ha. Please laugh. Buzz off, you stupid movie. Also, how does Bo even know any of these toys? We learn in Lamp Life that she spent her entire time in the antique store glued to a stationary position. When in the world did she get the chance to meet the pinball machine toys? I just- what? Now it's time to meet yet another new character. John Wick. Yep. Another new character. Not like we've already been introduced to a truckload of new toys or anything like that. But wait, look at all the new toys they introduced in Toy Story 3! You don't have a problem with that, do you? No, shut up! That is a blatant false equivalency and you are lying if you say otherwise. Toy Story 3 did not have to sideline the entirety of the original cast in order to shine a light on their new characters. They maintained the family dynamic from the first two movies and still managed to make you care about all the new characters in spite of it. But in this movie, they have to lock all the toys we actually care about into the RV to make you go into character withdrawal, and then shove new characters onto the screen to satisfy your itch. Oh, and one other thing, this toy is absolutely useless to this film. There is absolutely nothing they do throughout the movie that could not have been easily accomplished in his absence. And no, using him to jump the aisle does not count because that is the most brain-dead plan for reaching the cabin you could have ever come up with as I discussed earlier. This does nothing but put them in unnecessary danger, there is no reason to make this jump. Just distract the cat and then stack on top of each other like you already planned to do in Toy Story of Terror. I'll go get Woody. Together we'll be able to reach the handle. There's a blatantly obvious path to success that the characters are choosing to completely ignore just to drag out this film even more. Hey, remember this scene from Phineas and Ferb? There must be some trick to opening this case. A latch or some way to twist it or... Or we could hit it with a rock. Yeah, that works. No, no, the other one. We have to figure out how to activate it. Or we could hit it with a rock.
No, no, the other one. How many jelly beans in the jar? So the base of the jar is pi times radius squared. Pi? Oh, for crying out loud. <laughs> there, zero. Okay, technically, that is correct. But you did not show your work. I will in about 20 minutes. Well, what do you know? The characters are faced with a problem they need to overcome, someone suggests a ridiculously overcomplicated strategy, and then someone else points out an infinitely easier instant win plan they could use instead and instantly solve the puzzle. Phineas and Ferb did this better in 2010 and 2012 than a $200 million Pixar film released in 2019. Awesome. Why does Buford Van Stom have a better understanding of problem-solving skills than Bo Peep? But as if that wasn't bad enough, there's one more aspect of John Wick's character that we haven't gone over yet. He once had a kid named Mijon who saw his commercial on TV and wanted the toy for himself, only to realize that it was all a load of hooey and the toy can't actually make the jumps that the ads claim that he can. And as a result of the kid making this discovery, he throws John Wick away because of the false advertising and winds up giving him PTSD for the rest of his life anytime anyone ever mentions the word kid. Please, Mr. Kaboom, this is really important. My kid... You have a kid? Ah, uh, oh, hey, Duke. Show us some more poses. What do you say? I had a kid. Oh, no. And this is how this struggle is portrayed by this writing team. Okay, okay. Calm down, Duke. That was a long time ago. Cooley, you frosty gremlin. Buzz off. Stop doing this. Stop trampling all over the original trilogy with every scene you cobble together. Remember in the first video when I went over how heartbreakingly wonderful Jesse's backstory is? Remember in Toy Story 3 when Chuckles tells the tale of how Lotso's worldview became warped after being accidentally left behind and subsequently replaced, which is a situation disturbingly similar to what may have wound up happening to Woody? And, uh, you know, Woody could have been in that same situation. He could have gotten lost and come back and found a new Woody and, uh, you know, we like to think that Lotso and Woody are very alike in a lot of ways, but at this moment, Lotso makes a bad choice. You know how these scenes are handled with nothing but professionalism and maturity in regards to the subject matter of abandonment and growing up? Or perhaps coming to terms with being another cog in a machine? You know how every single element in this scene works to elicit a saddened emotional reaction from the audience because the writers understood total consistency and emotional intelligence? Yeah? Well, not anymore! Now we need to all stop and have a laugh at the funny Keanu Reeves toy undergoing significant PTSD instead of encouraging the audience to empathize with him in any meaningful way. And the sad part is that it works. Listen to this garbage. Rijon. Rijon was so excited when he got me after Christmas. It was the happiest boxing day of my life. The audience is fell for this. The writers had them wrapped around their little finger despite the fact that the subject of abandonment should not be handled with this jovial attitude that Josh Cooley really loves to employ in regards to extremely serious topics. This character is terrible from every conceivable aspect, both in terms of how he spits on previous characters' backstories and in terms of how he impacts the plot of this film. But because he's voiced by Keanu Reeves, that's all it takes for people to lose their minds over him. And while we're at it, it's the same thing for the Looney Tunes. Pixar got a legendary comedic duo to voice their characters and that's all it takes for people to eat this schlop up. Just get immensely talented voice actors to carry your script for you whenever you fail to write something that can survive on its own. Works every single time. But as if all that wasn't bad enough, this scene isn't over yet, because Bo still has to formally request his help before they can get on with the plot. As is standard procedure with lengthy strings of nonsense in the script, I'll run you through the whole scene, and then I'll tell you why none of it makes any sense. Bo Peep tells Neo that she needs his help because Annabelle has fork face in her sheep, to which Neo empathetically says, No. Billy? Go to Gruff? Those are my girls. <sighs> he then asks her why she was getting tangled up with Annabelle in the first place, to which she says that some toy thought it would be a good idea to wander into the aisle, leading to Neo talking about how it doesn't make any sense to do that, and that the best route to the cabinet is behind the shelves, and that the toy who wandered into the aisle is a complete idiot for doing that. <sighs> What the f- I can't say. Who wrote this garbage? Where do I even begin? I- Okay, first. You know the names of her sheep? How? Literally how? How would you know their names at all? You've been in the pinball machine this whole time, which we know since this is where Bo knew to find him despite not being in the antique store for a long time, and we also know that Bo never left her lamp while she was here. She was literally glued down until she broke out and escaped the store. When did you ever get the chance to meet him, let alone introduce your sheep to him? Also, really? You expect me to believe that Bo 
Bo would consciously tell the names of her sheep to Neo, but would only mention them in passing around Woody? Are you kidding me? What bird brain on the writing team came up with that? Also, remember earlier when I said they were going to use the fact that Woody doesn't know the names of her sheep to try to make him look even worse because the people who wrote this movie actively hate these characters? Yeah, well, here's the payoff for all those setups that I established earlier. Second, listen to this dialogue. And I mean really listen to it. Think really hard about what these characters are saying. What were you doing getting tangled up with Gabby Gabby? You know better. Yeah. Some toy thought it would be a good idea to wander into the aisle. That answer doesn't make any sense. You were already entangled with Annabelle from the minute she kidnapped Fourface for use as a hostage. It has absolutely nothing to do with Woody walking into the aisle. He was already on her radar. You just wanted an excuse to belittle Woody for doing what he did. Again. And as a gentle reminder, him wandering into the aisle to get to the cabinet would have worked flawlessly if you guys had the key, which was the only piece of information about this plan you didn't tell him and that he therefore could not have possibly accounted for in his decision making process. But you just completely ignore all that context because you are a condescending bi- I can't say. Third, Johnny Silverhand says that The best route is behind the shell. By which he means that they need to navigate behind the shelves in order to reach the jump point, which doesn't make any sense at all because it literally doesn't matter what route you take to reach that jump when you're gonna end up in the field of vision of the dummies no matter what. This conversation is bleeding out as we're talking about it. Nothing the characters are saying is running with any amount of logic whatsoever. Who wrote this cognitive diarrhea? Bo gives Johnny a motivational speech and instantly converts him from feeling the big sad to feeling happy through the power of words while Woody stands around like a useless plank of wood because Bo Peep is so awesome and Woody sucks at everything and is... Well, I'll just let the film describe him. He's useless. As if we needed any further confirmation as to what these writers' motivations were when they were making this stupid movie. To actively destroy the heroes of the original trilogy no matter what it takes come hell or high water. Woody would not just stand around here doing nothing. He was the leader of the original trilogy. He was a problem solver. He led the toys. He wouldn't just twiddle his thumbs while Bo does all the work. What are you people doing to these characters? So then Buzz and the gang join up with Woody and Bo in the pinball machine and it is revealed that they have successfully obtained the key. How do they do this, you may ask? Oh. My. God. Again. Again. We're doing it again. We're doing it again. How many times are you just gonna make these characters continually get lucky over and over again? Pixar literally has a poster of storytelling rules, one of which explicitly states that coincidences that get characters out of trouble is cheating, and yet here you are shoving the characters from point to point through nothing but pure contrivance and coincidence with absolutely no self-awareness whatsoever. This was just an answer to, we didn't know how they'd do it. <laughs> and we knew it had to be fast and funny, and this was fast and funny, That's so... about as fast as it could be. <laughs> that means you need to rewrite your script, you chuckleheads! If you have written your characters into a situation where you literally cannot think of a way for them to accomplish their mission, then you need to rewind a bit and rework the story to a point where you can come up with a reasonable solution to the problem. You don't just cheat your way out of it by having the shopkeeper conveniently place the key right in front of the characters who need it at the exact moment they needed it! <laughs> oh, what? Whatever, moving on. Okay, now it's time to set the plan in motion. They stealthily move beneath the shelves, and then Woody and Bo climb up to a film projector and use the reel inside it to lift up Ted's launcher and- What- what are you doing? Just walk across the aisle to the cabinet! This is pointless! Watch this scene again. Bo looks at the Chucky doll, waits for it to turn its head, and then walks out of cover. She fully understands the concept of stealthily navigating the aisle, and yet still wants to commit to the most unstealthy and obvious stunt you could possibly imagine. This is absolutely ridiculous. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Show me that shot again. What? There are no- Chucky dolls on this side of the cabinet! Look at this! There's one on this corner and one on this corner, but nobody guarding this entire side of the cabinet! Why do you not have anybody guarding the side of the cabinet that has the entrance doors on it?! And wait a minute! If the shopkeeper is distracted by a customer and there's nobody actually guarding the side of the cabinet, then you don't need to do the jump! Literally just walk across the aisle, form a tower of toys, open the door, get fork face, and then leave! Woody already did that earlier when there was a doll guarding the area and almost got away with it! You are guaranteed a win if you run across cross right now. You don't need Ted. And if you absolutely want to include him in your script so you can plaster Keanu Reeves all over the marketing, then just have him distract the cat since we learn later that said cat is clearly incapable of keeping up with him. You don't need to do this incredibly risky jump. This is all pointless. What are you doing? Who wrote this? What is happening to the script? You know, you're always trying to boil down to the, uh, to the essentials uh, in the writing. I guess that little lesson never got passed on to this writing team. Oh my god. Okay, whatever. Moving on. Bo tells Woody that she didn't want to sit around on the shelf waiting for her life to happen, so she left. And that she'll be hitching a ride with the traveling carnival and going off to see the world after she collects the XP for finishing the Fork Face side quest. Then we get the shot that seems to have been specifically crafted for use in the trailer so that Pixar can flex their muscles a bit more. Except that this gorgeous shot doesn't make any sense because it lasts for literally less than a minute and then the store magically goes back to the way that it was beforehand. It's just the ceiling of an antique store, but it has 
had to be this beautiful, magical thing. It was just that right time of day when the light hits the, yeah, the, hits the chandeliers. Magic hour. Yeah, the crazy thing about magic hour is that it lasts for a little bit more than just a few seconds. The sun literally popped into position for less than a minute, and then all of a sudden, the pretty lights are gone. What the f I can't say. And now it's time to begin what may very well be the single worst scene in the entire film. I hesitate to call it the worst overall as long as the ending exists, but it's definitely the worst action scene. We are gonna have to go through this insanity in slow motion because there's hardly a second of screen time where something isn't broken in this scene. Let's break this trash down. The scene begins with Woody and, uh, Johnny Utah barreling towards a ramp, but then... Huh? It's a commercial. It's a commercial. It's not real. Oh, for Pete's sake, stop it! This is all just one big joke to you! You have no respect for the previous movies. You gave this evil Knievel knockoff an emotionally scarring backstory just like Jesse and Lotso had, and then played it up for laughs because you hate this series with every fiber of your being. Just admit it already. If you had the chance to remake those movies, you'd make Jesse's backstory out to be a hilarious event in her life and portray her chronic claustrophobia and fear of abandonment as funny jokes and you wouldn't even think twice about it. But it doesn't even matter because Utah perfectly makes the jump anyway and Woody successfully grabs onto the handle of the cabinet while Johnny crashes to the floor and drives away to distract the cat. Meaning that you literally could have just had him do this in the first place and then sent Woody to climb up to the cabin and absolutely nothing would have changed in the slightest. But you had to get that cool trailer shot in there, didn't ya? Okay, so then Bo ziplines across to join Woody and then climb inside to retrieve Forkface. Meanwhile, outside, Weeble Wobble jumps onto Buzz's shoulder and lets him know that the junkie dolls have disappeared from on top of the cabin and it is revealed that they actually teleported behind Buzz and the Looney Tunes. How? How did you do that? Why does everybody keep teleporting all over the place in this movie? How did the dummies climb down off the cabinet, walk through the aisle, and then climb up behind Buzz without Weeble noticing them. How could she possibly not have seen that? Her entire job was to stand up here and be a lookout. She had one job and she failed colossally. Why did it take you this long to bounce back to relay the incredibly urgent message that the dummies had disappeared? And actually, how didn't Buzz see the dummies climb down? He was looking straight ahead prior to this point. How did none of you see them climb down from the cabinet? How did you climb up here so quickly? <sighs> back inside the cabinet, Annabelle and the Chucky dolls appear out of nowhere and corner Woody and Bo Peep. And so, seeing that he's in trouble, Buzz dispatches the two dolls effortlessly and then quickly grabs a string and pulls back to yank Woody out of there and- Wait, wait, wait a minute. Who was holding onto the string as an anchor when you were all captured by the dummies? They had hold of all of you and none of you were holding onto the string, so who was making sure this thing didn't roll off the platform? <sighs> Whatever. Buzz pulls Woody out of the cabinet while Annabelle simultaneously grabs hold of Woody's pull string, which then causes his voice box to play a line, which then causes the cat to turn into tension away from Johnny Utah and onto Woody, which ultimately results in Buzz engaging in a tug-of-war battle with Annabelle on the Chucky doll while Woody dangles over a highly dangerous cat. I cannot understate how much is wrong with just this one shot. First of all, pay attention to Bo Peep throughout this scene. In this shot, Bo is standing back to back with Woody surrounded by the dolls, and in the very next shot of the cabinet, she disappears into thin air. Where did you go? What happened to you? Did you also gain magical teleportation skills? Why does everyone keep teleporting in this movie? If you didn't disappear from the scene, Annabelle would have immediately lost, so the writers knew they had to get her out of the shot, but they couldn't think of a reasonable way for that to happen, so they just said, screw it, and just deleted her from the scene. This movie is full of baloney. Second, Nobody. the cat notices Woody's voice box talking, but not the humans. Seriously? The shopkeeper and customers don't hear this? Even if you think they wouldn't hear Woody, you are never in a million years gonna get me to believe that they wouldn't hear the cat freaking out when last she saw it, the cat was sound asleep. This movie is full of baloney. Third, this is not how pull strings work. Woody's voice box would not be saying any lines because the sound will only play once the string is released and the tension built up turns the disc to play the sound. And this is clearly something the writers are aware of, for once, because in every other instance throughout this movie that a pull string is pulled, the voice line does not play until the string is released. But because you couldn't think of a way to reasonably interweave the cat with the main action, you just threw your hands up into the air and said, oh, I don't know, his voice box plays a line, I, I guess. Which doesn't make any sense at all, and makes even less sense that the voice box would continually play multiple lines while the string is extending. <laughs> And the reason why this is so important is because his voice box playing a line is the only reason why the cat notices he's there at all and enters the battlefield. A cat which proves to be a monumental player in the battle that's about to ensue. This movie is full of baloney. Fourth, the dummy wins this battle of tug of war? How? Literally how is a ventriloquist dummy who barely has any control of his limbs stronger than Space Ranger action figure Buzz Lightyear? Look at this. The stupid dummy pulls in Woody and causes Buzz to drop to his knees all by himself! 
How in the name of eating utensils did you win this? And where in the world is Bo right now? Oh wait, there she is. Wait a minute, what the heck were you doing back there around the corner? Woody was literally about to have his voice box ripped out of him. What were you doing? Oh, please tell me you were trying to find your sheep. Please tell me that you care more about the sheep that are literally dangling from Chucky's rear end than Woody who is currently about to lose his voice box. Please tell me that's what you were doing, I dare you. You should have been right here from the beginning fighting off the dummies. You were right there, but then the writers cheated again by teleporting you out of the shot only to bring you right back into the battle anyway! This movie is full of baloney! Ah, <sighs> anyway, Bo effortlessly dispatches Annabelle and Chucky and finds her sheep and then she- Girls! Drop it. WHAT?! ARE YOU KIDDING ME?! YOU COULD HAVE DONE THIS THE WHOLE TIME! THIS LITERALLY ALL IT TOOK! ALL YOU HAD TO DO WAS LITERALLY JUST TELL YOUR SHEEP TO DROP IT! AND THEY'D HAVE BEEN RELEASED FROM THE GRASP OF THE DUMMIES IMMEDIATELY?! THEN WHY DIDN'T YOU DO THAT EARLIER?! YOU HAD THE AUDACITY TO SIT THERE AND CHEW OUT WOODY FOR DOING THIS SENSIBLE THING JUST BECAUSE HE CHOSE NOT TO ADHERE TO YOUR BRAIN DEAD PLAN WHEN ALL ALONG ALL YOU HAD TO DO WAS SAY TWO WORDS AND IMMEDIATELY FREE YOUR SHEEP! YOU ARE A TERRIBLE PERSON! YOU'RE EITHER TOO STUPID TO REALIZE WHAT YOU'VE DONE OR YOU'RE TOO MUCH OF A HEARTLESS MONSTER TO CARE! BUT WAIT! WE'RE NOT DONE YET BECAUSE ANOTHER CHUCKY doll teleports into the scene behind Woody and the altercation causes him to knock Fourface out of the cabinet and onto the floor below where he instantly becomes prime real estate for the cat's dinner and where is Keanu Reeves? What is he doing right now? You're supposed to be distracting the cat. That's your one job. What are you doing? The whole point of this mission was to rescue the spork and the sheep and one of those two toys is about to become cat child if you don't do something about it. But then, then, Bo says that they need to go and jumps onto the zip line literally less than a second before Woody grabs the string and pulls it taut. Watch this shot again in slow motion. Bo had no way of knowing what Woody was going to do. If he didn't grab this string to pull it taut at that exact moment, Bo would have plummeted to her death and shattered to porcelain pieces. Quite the ballsy move, Bo. Good lord. Also, Bo tells Woody that it's time to go despite the fact that Fourface is in mortal danger. They are in this situation right now because she agreed to help Woody rescue this spork. He is the catalyst of all of this. He is the reason you are here right now. And you are more more than willing to completely abandon him in spite of all of that, which, while I can't exactly say is out of character for this new version of Bo, it is very indicative of the fact that Bo's interests do not align with Woody to even a minor degree. She was there to get her sheep and get out. She didn't care about Fourface in the slightest. Absolute I can't say. But fear not, everyone, because while Woody's competence may have been obliterated by this movie, his undying loyalty to his friends in the face of danger has not been. And so he fearlessly jumps down from his cabinet to rescue Fortface and aims for the cat? Why did you aim for the cat? Why did you do this in the way that you did? Here's a thought. Tell Buzz what you're gonna do so he and Bo can brace for the sudden shift and wait, jump down, grab the stupid spork, and then have him yank you away to safety. Kinda like what you did in the opening scene of the movie. You chose the stupidest possible way to to do this, and as a result, Bo loses her grip and starts falling towards the ground, but before she dies, she grabs a hold of the string to secure herself, but oh no! She loses hold of her sheep and they start careening towards the floor, and so they die. Oh wait, no they don't? But do what? Do you people understand what these toys are made out of? Do you understand how fragile porcelain is? Bo Peep was kept out of Toy Story 3 for this very reason, because if you gave a porcelain doll to a rampaging caterpillar room toddler, or if you had her undergo this landfill scene, then she'd have died about 17 times. The official Bo Peep toy, which has the certificate of authenticity from Pixar, looks just like a porcelain doll, but isn't actually one because any child that had an actual Bo Peep doll made of porcelain would have broken her within the first hour of owning it. There's no other way to say this. You're dead. You are dead. You're like super dead. You cracked the instant you hit the ledge and then shattered to pieces when you hit the floor. You did not lose a single toe and then land safely on the ground like nothing happened. How do you keep not dying? How many times do I have to kill you, boy? So then Woody tries to wrangle the cat, which only leads to him tumbling backward and pulling all the other toys down into the danger zone with him, but as it happens, Buzz safely lands on Bonnie's backpack? How is Bonnie's backpack here? How did this happen? You were in the store for less than a minute. Why did you take off your backpack? It's not damaged. The straps are perfectly fine and you were holding onto said straps, so it definitely didn't accidentally fall off, so that means you must have consciously chosen to take off your backpack. Why? You came in here and then immediately left. Why did you do that? Were you trying to get a second date with the antique store? When did you find the time to do this? How did you even make it out of the antique store like this? How did your mom not notice that you didn't have your backpack on, especially when, A, you were holding your mom's hand both when you entered the store and when you left the store, but you could not have possibly taken off the backpack without letting go of her hand, and there's absolutely no way the mom wouldn't have noticed you let go of her hand. And B, don't forget your 
backpack. Don't forget your backpack. Don't forget your backpack. And wait a minute, she never even made it to this part of the antique store. They were at the same spot they were at when Bonnie first entered the store earlier in the film, in front of the glass cabinet, and Bonnie never came anywhere near them. They walked in and then walked right back out again. But in order for this backpack to have gotten here, she would have had to also walk all the way over here to drop it off. That doesn't make any sense because we literally saw them the entire time and they never came over here. And I'd like to remind you all that the only reason she even had a backpack to drop off in the store in the first place is because Bonnie randomly decided to put it on during a quick search outside the RV despite the fact that she didn't have it on when she walked out the door. What is happening in the script? Who wrote this? What is going on anymore? Then the stupid cat gets distracted by Weevil Wobble. Woody, what are you still doing on the cat's back? Look at him. He's literally just lying limp on the cat's back doing absolutely nothing. The cat is distracted by Weevil. Grab Fourface while you have the chance. What are you doing? Grab Fourface and then try to wrangle the cat so that it doesn't get... <laughs> Exactly! Anyway, she's dead since there's no way the cat didn't swallow that tiny little thing immediately. And then Annabelle finally wakes up again and sends every single Chucky doll to corner Woody and prevent him from leaving while the cat just runs around in a circle and nobody else is doing anything to help! Why isn't Buzz helping Woody? How many times do I have to keep reminding you useless sandbags about these scenes in the original trilogy? Buzz would not sit around while Woody was in danger. But it's not just him this time. Nobody's doing anything to help here. They are literally standing on the sidelines of the battlefield doing diddly squat! Just standing around like useless potatoes. What are you doing? doing? How are none of the customers seeing this? How does a shopkeeper not hear this calamity? Then Bo orders everyone to grab onto the string, thus forming a conga line of idiots that Jack Trivan leads in a wild chase out of the store, and then they leave Fortface behind? Are you kidding me? You idiots had one mission. One. Rescue the spork. And you couldn't even do that. This is like navigating the temple in Raiders of the Lost Ark and then leaving before taking the idol. Not a single one of you thought to grab Fortface before you escaped the antique store? Really? So then Bo pulls out a dresser to take down the Chucky dolls, and Jack leads everyone out the store up a plank of wood that just so happened to be placed at the perfect angle to serve as a ramp out of the store through a single pane of glass that just happens to be missing? There's not only one singular pane of glass that's just missing for some reason, but also a ramp that conveniently leads directly up to it. What is this script? Nothing runs with any cause and effect. It's all just a never-ending string of characters getting incredibly lucky every second that they're on screen. And then the cat vomits up Weeble? How did you not swallow this thing instantly? How are you this active despite presumably choking on the damn thing? And then the cat just gives up? Why? Up until two seconds ago, you were dead set on eating every single one of these toys, but now you're just gonna shrink back into the store? Why? What is happening right now? Who wrote this? What was this scene? What did I just watch? Nothing that happened throughout that entire sequence made even a little bit of sense, and I am absolutely astonished that nobody at Pixar saw any problems with even a single one of those things before signing off on the script. How did this happen? Ugh, this stupid script! Oh my god. Okay, so then Woody turns to ask if everyone's alright, and everyone is, so he immediately says that they can still get Fortface out of there before they lock him up again if they hurry, because Woody's loyalty and resolve is unbreakable no matter the odds he's up against. But absolutely Absolutely nobody else shares his determination, including Buzz. Buzz Lightyear does not side with Woody in his determination to rescue the spork that he should know full well means the world to Bonnie. Ah, but you see, Buzz actually has a reason why he doesn't think they should go back inside right now. And it goes like this. He saw Bonnie's backpack in the antique store. And so long as that backpack is in the antique store, Bonnie has to go back to get it, so they still have time to think of a more detailed plan rather than rushing in blindly. Now that sounds like solid logic, until you think about it for five seconds and then you realize that it doesn't matter at all. Buzz, the issue is not that Woody is afraid that they're running out of time before Bonnie leaves. The issue is that they have a much better shot at getting Forkface out of there if he's not locked in the cabinet, so they need to move fast before they get the chance to do so. Pointing out that Bonnie's backpack is still in the antique store doesn't address that issue at all. Also, it doesn't even hold as isolated basic logic anyway. Bonnie could very easily forget her backpack, as evidenced by earlier scenes in the film, and her forgetful nature in general, and the fact that she entered the store midday and it is now nighttime and she still hasn't realized that her backpack is missing should probably tell you something about the likelihood of her remembering it. Also, also, the presence of that backpack in the store doesn't make rescuing Forkface any easier. In fact, it makes it even harder because if your plan is to return to the antique store in the RV when they realize the backpack is missing, which you confirm to be the case shortly after this scene, then you now have even more people in that store to try to sneak around in an extremely limited time window to get into the cabinet and get Forkface out of there, all of which has to be done without any of the humans seeing you despite the backpack being right next to the cabinet. Not that this film cares about toys not being seen by humans given how fast and loose they've been throughout the entire runtime, but you get my point. This is a ridiculous plan that doesn't account for the situation at all. This movie is full of baloney. But for as stupid as Buzz bringing this up is, the next conversation makes even less sense. Bo tells Woody that... Nobody wants this! Because she's a heartless monster. Look, I don't like this sport. In fact, I hate everything about him. I don't know if you
you could tell. But that doesn't mean I want to leave him for dead, especially because we can clearly see how important he is to Bonnie. I can at least mildly understand the Looney Tunes and Keanu Reeves not wanting to go back inside, but Buzz agreed to be with Woody for infinity and beyond. And Bo shouldn't be confused by why Woody wants to go back inside given everything she knows about his values and principles. And yet, because the writers don't understand these characters, she is utterly baffled and repeatedly asks him why he wants to rescue Forkface. And his response is... Because! Why? Just because! Which doesn't make any sense because seconds later he says... Bonnie needs Forky. So why didn't you just say that in the first place? But then, we get this little humdinger of a line. No. You need Bonnie. What? What are you talking about? Who wrote that? You aren't making any sense. This isn't because Woody wants to be with Bonnie. It's because Woody wants to reunite Forkface with Bonnie because he sees how much Bonnie misses him. Kinda like that thing that you said in the first movie. If only you could see how much Andy misses you. But because the writers fundamentally misunderstand everything about the world and characters they're writing for, they just make Bo contract amnesia about everything they've been through over the years, and then subsequently make her say one of the stupidest things in the entire series. If Woody's motivation was just to be with Bonnie because he needs her so badly, then he could just go run back to the RV right now with Buzz and immediately accomplish that objective. Yet he doesn't do that. He's willing to risk his life to save Forkface because his loyalty always lies with what will make his child happy. But apparently you're too brained to understand understand that because the writers aren't capable of writing characters that are smarter than they are. Then Bo says that there are plenty of kids out there and that it can't be all about the one he's still clinging to, which is inherently a line that makes you want to jump off a roof, but thankfully I don't have to lose it this time because Woody's gonna do it for me. It's called loyalty. Something a lost toy wouldn't understand. I swear to God, remember this line. Do not forget this line of dialogue. Burn it into your brain. Woody is all about loyalty. It is his core character trait that above all else, he is loyal to his kid and to his friends and that no toy ever gets left behind. Don't forget this. But the stupidity isn't over yet, because then Bugs says, Find our own kid. You're crazy. Find your own kid? You, you were literally begging and pleading with Buzz to get you your own kid earlier! Why did it take you this long to realize that because you are literally free now, you can go wherever you want and find your own kid anywhere? But then, then, for the final wave of cognitive sewage, we get one last interaction between Woody and Buzz before this scene ends. Woody, you did all you could. Time to go home. Who? are you? What happened to the Buzz Lightyear that would never abandon a toy just like Woody taught you to do? Even if you want to stay consistent within this film, what happened to the Buzz Lightyear who just hours ago said, Woody was right. We all should have been safeguarding the utensil. You have seen how distraught Bonnie is over the stupid spork. You know how damaging it's going to be to her if you don't get Forface back to her before you leave. What is this scene? Who wrote this? Now I want you to listen up and listen good because you probably are not going to believe what I'm going to say next. But I assure I assure you, I am not lying to you, I am not kidding you here, the writers are in fact this stupid, and this does, in fact, actually happen in this moronic movie. Woody climbs back into the antique store because he doesn't leave toys behind, and then, in contemplating whether or not he should follow him inside, Buzz starts pushing the buns on his chest so they can tell him what to do, and they all tell him to retreat, fall back, and return to Star Command, which Buzz then interprets as his inner voice telling him to go back to the RV, and as a result, Buzz abandons Woody and flees the scene back to the RV, all because his voice box told him to. I cannot understate how much monumentally stupid this is. This would never, ever happen. There is no way in the world Buzz would ever leave Woody behind for any reason ever, let alone because a stupid buttons on his chest told him he needs to leave. He didn't abandon him when Scud was about to eat him. He didn't abandon him when Al kidnapped him or at any point between then and the point when Woody was safely back with the group and away from the clutches of the prospector. And he didn't abandon Woody when he was seconds away from being shredded to pieces. No way in the world are you ever going to get me to believe that Buzz is unwilling to help Woody fight out some stupid Chucky dolls on a cat when he was willing to risk being shredded to pieces when Woody needed his help. So Buzz here, this is continuing the joke of his inner voice. No, shut up, stop talking. Someone duct tape your mouth shut. This isn't a joke. This is character assassination. This is you taking everything these characters stood for and tearing them to pieces because you find it funny. You think it's so hilarious to destroy characters that meant the world to kids and adults all around the world without any shred of remorse. This was a way to get him to go back to the RV so that Woody could be alone with Gabby. Yeah, because obviously Buzz would never leave Woody, so you had to contrive a nonsensical scenario in which he does, and you still failed! It w didn't make sense to have Buzz 
just chase after Woody, and it would have just caused more story problems. <laughs> then that means you need to rewrite your script so you can alleviate those story problems. That doesn't mean you just snap your fingers and contrive nonsensical reasons for characters to do things because you aren't talented enough to write a natural reason for them to happen, and you're either too stupid or too malicious to honor the characters that were established over 25 years ago. Have you ever seen a director slay their intelligence and credibility this publicly and with this much confidence? Those garbage bags in the background are another example of something that shouldn't be hard, but is. Yeah, the characters couldn't interact with them. <laughs> There's a couple of shots where the sheep are touching them, but not r really or something. I, I... You know, it's funny because the animators who made Toy Story 3 managed to make the trash bags work and had characters constantly moving around inside. And that movie came out nine years ago. So you certainly can't blame technology on this one. Uh, they tried to explain it to me. And I'm like, I don't, I don't understand. <laughs> I know you don't understand, Cooley. That's the moral of this movie, is you not understanding this world, these stories, or these characters, and doing it all with overinflated and unearned confidence. So now it's time for the final confrontation against Annabelle, and there isn't a single thing about this scene that I don't hate. But you know the drill, I'll run through it all, and then we'll talk about it. Woody opens the curtain and comes face to face with Annabelle and her army of Chucky dolls. She tauntingly tells him that she knew he'd be back, and he responds by saying that she doesn't know him, to which she says that she actually does know him, and she begins to repeat back what Forkface told her earlier in the film, talking about how he was left in the closet feeling useless, and then tries to appeal to his morals by saying that the most noble thing a toy can do is to be there for a kid. And then... she... She proceeds to rattle off his entire life story, recounting all the major moments he spent with Andy from riding a bike with him, comforting him in times of need, and watching him grow up, and then offering that same level of comfort to Bonnie. She asks Woody if it's as wonderful as it sounds, to which she says that it was, followed by Annabelle saying she'd give anything to be loved the way Woody has been, and as a result of this conversation, Woody agrees to give up his voice box so long as she gives him fork face. And there it is, the exact moment when I first watched this film and I wanted to strangle something. We are stopping this dead in its tracks because it's finally time to talk about Annabelle as a villain. Let's not mince words here. She is an awful person. She is emotionally manipulative, torturous, and rotten to the core, committing terrible atrocities throughout this film, and yet she is rewarded for her evil actions out of the kindness of Woody's heart. No other toy Story villain has afforded this level of kindness. Sid ripped toys apart and stitched them back together to create his own abominations, which, while he may not have been aware that he was dealing damage to living beings, it was still causing great amounts of pain and suffering, and he showed no compunctions about destroying his sister's toys and terrifying her in the process. The prospector held Woody, Jesse, and Bullseye hostage to fulfill his selfish desire to go back to Japan, and was even willing to send Buzz plummeting to his death off the edge of the conveyor belts. And Lotso, aside from being a tyrannical dictator who condemned the toys to eternal torture in the catapult, room and controlling everyone around him with an iron fist, was willing to condemn Woody and the gang to death by incineration even after they saved his life. These people are evil with corrupted souls who should not be defended under any circumstances. But you know something else about all three of these villains? They got their just desserts. Sid is now traumatized for the rest of his life. This child will never be the same. No level of therapy could ever repair the damage that was done to him in this scene. The prospector is now doomed to live out the rest of his life under the care of Amy who draws all over her toys, ultimately giving him his worst nightmare coming true, especially since he believes that the final destination for toys that belong to children is always the dump. And Lotso is now strapped to the front of the dumpster truck, and he'll stay like that forever, his arms and legs permanently stretched out to the sides as bugs permanently fly into his face and he slowly rots away as the years go by. And now we come to Annabelle, a toy who held Four-Face hostage was willing to, and almost successfully did, rip out Woody's voice box by hand, and he utilized emotional manipulation to coerce Woody into capitulating to her desires. And what is the end game for her actions? The very thing she always wanted, for Woody to give up his voice box. And the only thing that changes about her demeanor is that she goes from demanding Woody give it up to emotionally manipulating him and then saying, okay, but like, I really want the voice box though, please give it to me. No! Throwing Woody's emotional journeys with Andy and Bonnie back in his face and then and saying, I just want to be played with, does not excuse the things you've done throughout this movie. And if your response to that is to say, but she just wants to be played with, don't you feel bad for her? Okay, fine. Let's play this game with the other Toy Story villains. All Sid wanted to do was play with his toys the way he wanted to. It's not like he knew they were alive. All the prospector wanted to do was to be loved and adored by children for generations because he had to sit idly by and watch all the other toys on the dime store shelf be sold. All Lotso wanted was to feel important again. 
after watching himself get replaced by Daisy. He just wanted a place where he can feel like he mattered, where he would be played with respectfully and lovingly by children. See how easy it is? You can reframe any of their stories in this flowery way if you want to, and that's exactly what this film is trying to do. It's swelling the music and lighting the lights in the exact way they need to to emotionally manipulate you into thinking that she's not a terrible person the same way that she's manipulating Woody in this scene, and it's absolutely despicable. Music here is going into her theme when she was talking to Forky about wanting to be with, with Harmony. That way we know that this is true what she's saying, and we didn't want the audience in any way to think she was trying to trick him. The lighting also. Exactly. She walks into the warm light where he is. The dummies stay back in the cool light back there, or in cool darkness. No, shut up! Ignore the visual flair of music for a minute and just think about the actions she's taken. She's absolutely horrible. The fact that she has an emotionally scarring backstory doesn't matter at all because I promise you that saying, this person had a traumatic past and therefore all the evil actions they undertake are justified is not a road you want to go down. That is a slippery slope that I can guarantee you do not want to commit yourself to sliding down. And yet, she is handed her redemption and rewards on a silver platter. She gets exactly what she wants, and spoiler alert, when it doesn't work, the universe hand delivers her a second chance to achieve her dream. It's like she missed her stop on the elevator so the universe course corrected to give her more floors to get off at. And she doesn't even say sorry! She doesn't even apologize to Woody for what she's tried to do to him throughout this movie. She never faces any consequences for her actions, nor does she ever admit that she did anything wrong. And the absolute worst part of it is how Woody's decision is characterized. The film portrays his choice to give up his voice box as a noble act, but that is not what is happening here. He was forced into this. He only agrees to give it up because Annabelle emotionally manipulates Woody and coerces him into doing what she wants. It literally doesn't matter if he said yes or no, because whether or not he agreed, she was going to take his voice box anyway. And as the cherry on top, this is all allowed to happen because Forkface spilled his guts to Annabelle because he's an idiot, and because Woody made the single most ridiculous Freudian slip in the history of toy kind. I told you this is going to define the climax of this film, and it's absolutely pathetic. It doesn't even make any sense from a motivational perspective for her to want his voice box in the first place. If you need the new part so badly, then why don't you just get on the shopkeeper's computer and order a new one? If you can pull off all this insanity, then there's no way you can't swipe her credit card. If you need it that badly, then why don't you just do that? What was your plan gonna be if Woody never showed up? Also, most toys do not have a voice box, and you need look no further than Bonnie's toy collection to see that for yourself. Harmony may not need anything more than just a doll to be happy. She may not care whether you can talk or not. Nobody would ever even know that you need a voice box. For all you know, the kid might actually like you better if your voice box is busted. He's so ugly! I love him! In fact, had they gone down a route where Woody teaches her that she doesn't need a voice box to be loved by her child, this could have served as a really nice life lesson for the audience about being yourself, about how you don't need to change your appearance or who you are to be loved, that you don't need to try to make yourself better just to get people to like you, that you should want people to accept and love you for who you are, not for who they want you to be. But no. Instead, the writers of this film believe that Annabelle needs to literally replace her voice box just to be accepted. And if you think about this in a different light, such as comparing Gabby's defective voice box to people living with disabilities, it starts to send a much more disgusting message out to the world, which is straight up insulting when Finding Dory is a film in Pixar's catalog that masterfully tackles the topic of characters with disabilities. Dory, Destiny, Hank, and Bailey all have some kind of disability, but none of them let it define them. In fact, their stories all revolve around accomplishing incredible feats even in spite of their disabilities. They didn't need to conceal them or change anything about themselves. Compared to Toy Story 4, where the writers want kids to think that if they are born with any kind of a disability, they don't have a chance at being loved unless they find a way to change that. That is the message that the writers want people to take away from this film. And if they didn't intentionally want to send it, then that means they're just too stupid to realize what they've done. And given how they've written Annabelle, I can guarantee you they'll never admit that they did anything wrong. This is absolutely despicable. And when you stack this on top of all the other serious topics that you've handled so immaturely, you should be absolutely ashamed of yourselves. <sighs> So then we cut back to the RV where Magnum has only just managed to fix the flat tire? Why, why did it take you an entire day to fix a single flat tire? Why are you not using a jack? Did you not think to bring one in the RV in case this ever happened? Seriously? If you're so incompetent that it takes you all day to fix a flat tire, then why did you not just call roadside assistance? How did it take you all day to change a single tire? Why is everyone in this film so stupid? Can you change a tire? Anyway, just as the family's getting ready to leave, Buzz reveals his plan to the other toys. To wait for Bonnie to realize that her backpack is missing, and then magically rescue Woody and Forkface once they get there. Somehow. Let's see how well this plan works out for them. Okay, looks like we have everything. You good, Bonnie? Yep. Great. Let's get out of here. 
What a surprise. A kindergartner who's known to be forgetful didn't know that her school backpack isn't with her. I'm utterly stunned this plan failed. I truly, I'm, I'm just amazed. Gee, it's almost as if you're plea to Woody that, but Bonnie's backpack is in there. She has to go back at some point. Was a completely useless thing to say. But remember, Buzz is a moron now. It's apparently, just... Ah. It was a tough balance to show Woody's story and the story of all these other toys and Bo's story and all these new toys. There's just a lot of characters in this movie. You... What? It's tough to balance. What is this verbal diarrhea? Hey, Bumble Clowns, who was it that put all these new characters into the story again? You. You did that. You brought this on yourself. You showed a parade of new, useless characters that nobody cares about instead of bringing along the characters we actually have an emotional connection with and writing another adventure with this family of toys. You are complaining that it is a tough balance as if you aren't the director who had complete control over what new toys were and weren't added into the film. Buzz off, you stupid movie. So now that Bonnie has demonstrated appropriate behavior for a five-year-old child, despite Buzz assuming otherwise for some stupid reason, we need another plan to stop the family from leaving the carnival before they can rescue Woody and Forkface. And I kid you not, nobody has even the slightest idea of what to do next. They all just sit there like useless cabbages while Buzz starts pushing the stupid buttons on his chest again, hoping to tell him what to do. Buzz, what are you doing? I'm thinking. Oh, stop doing this! Buzz doesn't need a stupid inner voice to constantly guide him through the movie. Also, I have a very easy way for you to get them to stay again. Just go send Jesse to pop the tire again. The film has clearly demonstrated this man is useless and it takes him literally an entire day to fix a flat tire. Meaning that if you were to pick up that nail and then use it to pop the tire again, they would be delayed for an entire other day and give you potentially a full 24 hours before you'd be able to fix it. But because Buzz Jesse and all the other toys were all too brain dead to figure out what to do next. We instead get a shot of Buzz repeatedly pressing his buttons over and over again, desperately hoping they'll tell him what to do. Every other time throughout the movie, they told him exactly what he needed to hear in every situation, but all of a sudden, none of them are telling him anything useful. Awesome. But then... Then, we get the scene that made me do a double take to see if I misheard the dialogue or if the writers were actually this creatively dull. So because Buzz keeps mashing his buttons, it causes Magnum to say, Honey, will you please shut that toy off? Oh, now you hear the toy. Really? You hear it over the engine whirring surrounded by an active carnival, but you had absolutely no reaction to it in the middle of nowhere on the open road in the dead of the night when this happened. It's a secret mission in a turtle train. No! Buzz off! Stop it! Stop selectively altering the hearing capabilities of your characters whenever you can't figure out what to do next in your script. But that's not the worst part, because as Pearl picks up Buzz trying to look for an off switch, even turning around to ask Bonnie how to shut him off, he is continually mashing his buttons, which results in Magnum telling her to just put Buzz in the cabinet to muffle the noise, culminating in Buzz's galaxy brain plan to say, Uh, uh your backpack's in the antique store! Let's go! Oh no, my backpack! What? Are you kidding me? How did this happen? The mom doesn't even notice this. How do you not think that's extremely weird? Not two seconds ago, you were squabbling over how best to shut Buzz up because you were so sick of hearing him talk. And yet as soon as he says the most important line in the scene, she magically goes deaf? How did she not hear this? And don't try to tell me it's because Buzz was muffled by the cabinet because Bonnie heard him say the line. And she was all the way over here while Pearl was standing directly in front of Buzz. He literally says your backpack is in the antique store. And then Bonnie immediately remembers that her backpack is in the antique store. Are you going to tell me with a straight face that if you heard your daughter's toy say that, and then it ended up being true, that you wouldn't start to think something strange was going on? Not to mention the fact that the quality of Buzz's voice lines is drastically different compared to when he's talking normally and when his voice box is saying a line. Beyond. Your backpack's in the antique store. Let's go! Those two lines are back to back in this film and they could not sound any more different. How did Pearl not notice this? Also, they cheat! Again! 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 How many times? In order for Buzz to activate his voice box, he has to press buttons on his chest, meaning that he has to physically move his arm towards his chest. Whenever he's on camera, they show him deliberately waiting for Pearl to turn around so she can't see him do that. Which doesn't even make any sense by itself because Buzz doesn't have eyes in the back of his head so he has no way of knowing whether she's looking at him or not. But putting that aside, watch this shot very closely. Pearl turns her head back toward Bonnie, and then this happens. And when we cut back, she's looking right at him. Stop! Stop cheating! Stop being deliberately deceptive with your camera placements or trick the audience into thinking that your movie makes any sense! Let's run through that again. The mom turns toward Bonnie. You hear both the voice line and the sound effect of Buzz pressing his buttons. Toss it in the drawer. 
door. And when we cut back, she's looking at him, meaning that she was looking right at him, and yet he still somehow managed to push the button on his chest without her thinking something is awry. None of this makes any sense. This is all pointless. Just have Jesse cut the stupid tire again. Game over. And Buzz is not always the brightest crayon in the box. <laughs> Shut up, you defective toaster. Buzz is not stupid. I went over this in the last video. Buzz has always been one of, if not the smartest characters in the entire series. Were it not for his quick thinking, rational decision making, deductive abilities, and strategic planning, they never would have made it through the original trilogy. Don't you dare try to gaslight your audience into thinking otherwise with your slimy scumbag commentary like the hack writers you are. This idea of him just yelling out inside the thing and Bonnie yelling it from that was just so funny in the pitch. It worked. First of all, no, it didn't work. Nothing in this scene is functioning properly. It's all broken. None of it makes any sense. But second of all, do you need any more proof? They don't care about consistency. They don't care about honoring the characters of the past. So long as it's in service of a joke, they will drag every single character from the original trilogy through the mud come hell or high water. He does talk to Sid directly, and then also in the same movie earlier, he imitates Sid's mom's voice so to get Hannah to go downstairs. So it's been done before. No, stop, stop talking! Every time you clowns open your mouth in an attempt to justify this bleeding script, you just end up dumping a gallon of salt in the wound. Those are blatant false parallels, and I am going to tell you exactly why on the off chance that you hacks are actually too incompetent to realize the problem and aren't just being deliberately deceptive again with your commentary. In the first example you referenced, Woody was trying to get Sid to freak out over seeing toys come to life. That was the entire point of the scene, to overwhelm him with all the toys and to directly talk to him just seal the deal and get him to run away so he can save Buzz. And in the other example, he was trying to pass as a human when no human was around to see him, at which point he would hide himself away, wait for Hannah to run by, and then run in to get Buzz out of the tea party. Those two situations are radically different from trying to pass off your real voice as your voice box, and with a line that should absolutely freak the heck out of the mom. Well, instead of that being the plan, you're trying to convince him that this is totally normal. These plans follow logically and make sense. This plan was written by a wet noodle. Stop trying to drag these films into the pits of hell with your script. Get your sticky fingers off them. Okay, next scene. Maybe this one won't make me want to jump into an incinerator. Bo is leading the Looney Tunes, John Wick, and Weeble Wobble back to the carousel where they left the skunk mobile. But while she's getting ready to dart across, Weeble Wobble says this. What do you ask you for help? On your mark? And he treats you like that? Get set! He only cares about himself. He what? Did that cat eat your brains out? What do you mean he only cares about himself? The entire mission from the beginning has been all about rescuing Fortface, and Woody puts himself in great danger to keep him safe at all costs. In fact, his first reaction upon crashing in the alley outside was to turn to everyone else and ask, Is everyone okay? Now what would Bo's reaction have been if the situation were reversed and they successfully managed to rescue Fortface but not her sheep. Because given how she's treated everyone throughout this film, I can guarantee her first reaction would be to drag everyone back into the store to get her sheep out of there with absolutely no concern for anyone else. You have some nerve to accuse Woody of being selfish when Bo was literally willing to flee the scene as soon as she picked up her sheep, happily condemning Fourface to death and paying absolutely no mind whatsoever to Woody's mission of rescuing him. Also, did I hear that correctly? He treats you like that? What? The meanest thing he said to her was, It's called loyalty. Something a lost toy wouldn't understand. Now let's run through the laundry list of condescension that Bo Peeps engaged with throughout this movie. What did I say? I leave, you follow. You really want to help? Then stay out of my way. Just stand there and be quiet. I'll do the talking. My friend, no, no, no. He's my accessory. Some toy thought it would be a good idea to wander into the aisle. That doesn't make any sense. It doesn't, does it? Because the best route is behind the shelves. That would have been a better route, wouldn't it? Toy sounds like a complete idiot. He does. <laughs> Plenty of kids out there. It can't be just about the one you're still clinging to. Meanwhile... He treats you like that? that? He only cares about himself. I, I don't... I can't... How do you write either of those lines as if they make any sense at all? What is this scene? Who wrote this? Also, not one second later, Bo says... No! Which the Looney Tunes think means go, and they're immediately slammed into by the spinning carousel, and Bo just doesn't care at all. They are screaming in terror and pain, and she doesn't give one singular hoot about it. This could not be any more poetically moronic if you try. So then Bo gets pissed off because Weeble Wobble insulted Woody, and she says that he's always trying to do right by his kid, and that... You just gotta love him for it. I don't... I just... How did you not come to this realization literally five minutes ago? It took you five whole minutes to realize Woody's heart is always in his loyalty to his friends and his kid. Seriously? All right, so we could have the characters all break up at the end of the second act because of some stupid argument that makes no sense and is so clearly contrived and then get back together five seconds later. It's in nearly every animated movie released under the sun nowadays, even good ones, and it's even starting to affect game releases. And it's really starting to piss me off. Anyway, Bo runs across to the center of the carousel and repairs the tire from the skunk mobile that fell off earlier effortlessly 
in a matter of seconds, meaning that she is literally more capable of tire repair than an adult human. Awesome. Then she loads up her car. Wait, how did you retrieve the sticky hand? When did you retrieve the sticky hand? Last we saw it was dangling from the top of the carousel. When did you get it back? What is- how the- what is the script? And the Looney Tunes survived the carousel of death? I, really? You didn't get crushed by the- you, Huh? Okay, moving on. Woody wakes up after a surgery and then- Yay! Oh. <laughs> you are my best friend. Let's play all day. Oh, Benson. Did you hear that? Isn't that lovely? I hate everything about you. So then Annabelle goes off to live happily ever after with Harmony and she has absolutely no qualms whatsoever about abandoning all her Chucky dolls at the antique store forever because she is a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad person and Fort Face has finally returned to Woody just in time for Bonnie and her mom to call him waltzing into the store. Yeah, we called about the backpack. Oh, yes. I couldn't find it. You couldn't? What? How did you not find the backpack? It's literally lying on the floor next to the giant glass cabinet in the center of the store. How could you possibly not have found this thing? Wait, 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 what? How did it get there? We're nowhere near the glass cabinet right now. That is not the ground we last saw it on. Even the backpack can teleport now? Why does everything in this movie constantly teleport? Why are you so bad at running consistently? Oh, but wait, it gets so much worse. Because Woody immediately dives into the backpack, ready to go home to Bonnie, but then the stupid spork stops dead on his tracks because he wants to watch Animal get together with Harmony. And worse yet, Yet, Woody goes out to carry him into the backpack, but then stops to watch the show as well when Forkface cries about wanting to see her get her happy ending. Why? Why do you care? She did terrible things to you, and even if she didn't, you don't have time to muck around. Bonnie could find that backpack any second. You need to get inside that thing and get home immediately. You don't have time for this. Your entire goal since step one was to return Forkface to Bonnie. You were willing to stage a one cowboy assault on the antique store and take on Annabelle's entire army just to bring him home, but now you're abandoning that just so you can spectate her? Why? Why do you care? Yes, it's within Woody's character to not condemn toys to death even in spite of all they've done previously. We've seen that before with Lotso in the dump. But Annabelle is not in any mortal danger here. She's either gonna get with a kid or she isn't. There's a difference between consciously choosing not to let a toy die and consciously choosing to sit around doing nothing but watching her get her happy ending. Especially when the backpack has a window in it that you could be watching this through. Who wrote this? Anyway, Annabelle uses her voice box to ask Harmony to be her friend but she rejects her and tosses her into the bin of misery. And the scene is framed in this really harrowing way that makes it seem like this terrible, horrible thing that just happened and just makes me hate this film even more. That's all the directors know how to do. Use the lighting, music, and camera to manipulate your emotions into feeling exactly what they want you to feel, which is something that can be used to great effect if the script in question matches the emotion you are trying to elicit. But you can also use that power for evil to trick your audience into feeling sad for a villain who's done nothing but horrible things this whole movie. And to do that over and over and over again in nearly every scene because you know your script can't survive on its own, and candidly admit to it in the director's commentary as if emotional manipulation of an audience is some virtuous talent you have. But the crazy train ain't over yet, because Woody decides that Animal deserves her happy ending and he has a plan to make it happen. He tells Forkface to tell Buzz that he needs to get the RV to the merry-go-round. I don't know how he thinks they're going to accomplish that task, but whatever, we have bigger fish to fry here. You understand? Absolutely. What is a merry-go-round? The spinny ride with lights and, and horses. Oh, you mean a carousel? Yes, yeah, a carousel. How do you know what a carousel is? You've been alive for two days and you've never seen a carousel before. Why would you know what that is but not a merry-go-round? This doesn't- <sighs> Also, seriously? Neither Bonnie nor her mom hear you talking in the backpack that's on her back. Seriously? Man, the humans in this movie have incredibly selective hearing that just seems to prioritize whatever the plot needs to happen. So Woody jumps out of the backpack and Bonnie doesn't feel the shift in weight at all because of course she doesn't and runs over to the bin of misery to give Annabelle a pep talk. She's currently sulking and feeling the big sad because she got rejected, but then Woody says that- friend once told me there are plenty of kids out there and one of them is named Bonnie which doesn't make any sense at all. This is a desperate attempt to make it seem like Woody learns something from Bo Peep, but that doesn't track logically because what Woody is telling her is that he can take her back to Bonnie and that Bonnie will love her. So that all the other kids out there who aren't Bonnie literally don't matter at all right now, and there was no reason to say this line other than to try in desperation to make it seem like Bo taught him a valuable life lesson and it just falls flat on its face. No, you didn't! Hey, remember when he convinced Jesse and Bolza to come with him in Toy Story 2 by simply saying, Andy will play with all of us. I know it. Wouldn't you give anything just to have one more day with Emily? This is what it's all about. To make a child happy. And that. Besides, he's got a little sister. He does? Why did you say so? Let's go! He didn't need to waffle on about how there's plenty of kids in the sea. Also, why are you forgiving her? You weren't here for the scene where the writers and Anima both tried to manipulate the audience and Woody respectively. You should hate her right now. You missed this scene. What is going on? I swear to God, the script. 
Okay, so we're back in the RV now, and Fourface is telling all the other toys that Woody needs him to get to the carousel, which is a conversation that's only allowed to happen because Bonnie managed to fall asleep in the less than five minutes and spins since they left, despite being wide-eyed and energetic in the last scene, and because the parents can't hear the toys talking anymore, despite the fact that in their last scene, they whine about how Buzz wouldn't shut up. Is there anybody at Pixel working on keeping the script consistent? Does anybody have any idea what's happening in this film right now? Thankfully, Jesse comes up with another idea. I can't wait to see what her ingenious plan is in the next scene, but I'm afraid that we're gonna have to stop here for right now, because we are about to dive head first into this film's climax. The final act of the movie where these toys have to somehow turn this RV around and Woody and the gang have to somehow navigate through a crowded carnival to get back to Bonnie in time to leave. And believe it or not, none of it is going to make any sense. You are about to witness an absolutely ridiculous chain of nonsense that may very well stand as the most broken climax of any story that I have ever seen. But as if that's not enough, it will also spell the definitive and irrevocable assassination of the one character whose core principles have remained unharmed throughout this film. But that's all about to come to an end, and I can't wait to tell you all about it next time. Thanks for watching, everyone, and I hope to see you all next weekend for the grand finale of How Toy Story 4 Destroyed Everything. Goodbye!